Hey friends, welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. And I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you joined us for this conversation. Let's dive in. You two, we're kind of losing our minds that you are in this room right now. We, we have ha- been so excited. How long have we talked yes, about this? I don't so even know. Long. Yeah, I don't know how long we have talked about this, dreamed about this, imagined what it would be like to have the two of you in this house. This is your first trip to the Daystar house and in this room. These are two folks that we have long admired and respected and enjoy. And to have you both here. I'm going to purposefully try not to give away everything about you all talking about what you do, but I will simply tell a story that I've told the two of you, but I want to tell it publicly that when I was in college, I was a part of RUF and I kept meeting these guys, like the neatest guys, the coolest guys, and finding out that they had this one thing in common, all of them had either been campers at Alpine or had worked at Alpine Camp for Boys. Mm. And I didn't grow up knowing about it. So I was like, what is this place? And how is it generating some of the deepest, most substantive guys that I kept encountering? And little did I know then that it would lead to all this opportunity for relationship now, that I would get to bring my own boys to Father Sudden Camp when they were little, that... I would build a friendship with the two of you that I would get to be a part of staff training with your amazing staff and that we'd be sitting here in this room together having this conversation today. But I can't shout from the mountaintops enough about what the two of you are doing. So I'm going to not talk anymore about it because I want the two of you to tell about the work you do, how you how you found your way to the work you do. Before you do, I want to piggyback on that because I wasn't (laughs) familiar with it growing up. And I have gotten to where, of course, is my response all the time because I will encounter the same thing. Kind, substantive, Mm -hmm. thoughtful men. And I'll find out they either were counselors or went to Alpine growing up. And I always think, of course, he's an Alpine guy. I mean, literally, (laughs) that's my response every time. So y'all are doing something, which we're very excited to talk about. Thank you. I think. Is this the end of the podcast? Can we close in three <laughs> now? I think that's great. I think we've covered it. Um, we're thank you. Uh, mm. We're just so grateful to be with the two of you today. Mm. And the first time in, our, in the Yellow House, we've heard yeah. about the Yellow House for so many years from so many people that we admire in Nashville, whether it's Alpine or just friends that love you guys. So we're grateful for what you all are doing uh, for young people and have benefited uh, in our own uh, children's lives and at camp, certainly as we've gotten to build a relationship with you, David, uh, doing our staff training, which we can talk more about, but just has been so uh, life-giving to our staff. So thank you for having us. And we're just, we're excited to be here to talk to you guys. Us too. Will you just start by telling us a little bit about your family and then kind of how you found your way to the work you're doing? Do you mean to start? Yeah. Um, so we are co-directors at Alpine Camp for Boys. Um, Alpine is located on Lookout Mountain. Lookout Mountain runs from Tennessee through Georgia into Alabama. And so our summer camp is in Alabama, and we actually have raised our girls in Chattanooga. So we've been on the Tennessee end. Um, But I actually grew up at Alpine. My dad started camp in 1959. He grew up camping um, at another boys camp on the mountain. And my mom camped at DeSoto in I was one of two girls who got to grow up there, and I thought it was the most magical thing ever. Um, And then I went off to camp in the summers as well. But um, so much of my childhood has been spent on that mountain, in the river. Um, And Glenn, I'll let you kind of tell where you come in, and then we can get back to our story. Well, yeah, I loved camp so much that I got to marry the director's daughter. <laughs> I was a camper at Alpine for six summers. I was a, just a little, you know, nervous, quiet, uh, introverted kid from Jackson, Mississippi. And my parents sent me to Alpine 
Funny enough, uh, my dad was actually a camper at Alpine in the 60s. He yeah. was one of wow. her dad's first campers, one of those first summers oh. from Mississippi. And so when we came along, my brother and I, they were, you know, my mom and dad were like, this is what we want for our kids. So we got to go to Alpine in the summers. We had this great photo, actually, of when I was like a 10-year-old kid with with uh, at opening day with Carter's dad and I standing next to this great poplar tree that's still in front of our dining hall. Mm. Of course, we had the different, you know, we had the same, everything looks the same except for like our tube socks that were pulled up to our <laughs> knees, you know, in the like eight, late eighties. But, right. um, so I was a camper and then I was a counselor when I was in college at Ole Miss. It was just a place that I loved and had a huge part of my f- forming who I was really mm-hmm. outside of my parents, probably the place that formed me the most, um, the counselors. Mm-hmm. And so that was, that's our story. Um, we, we did meet in the eighth grade at an Alpine Camp DeSoto square dance. Oh, so wow. no promises parents out there, but you might, you know, <laughs> summer camp, you never know what might uh, come of that. So we met in eighth grade. The rest of the story is we ended up in college together and, uh, got married and, Did you mention our girls? We have twin girls. They're identical twin girls that are 18 years old. They're seniors in high school. Um, So we're down to the last, yeah, last little bit at home here. So Mm. um, that's another podcast or maybe some therapy with one of you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I would love to hear the years that you all have been doing this work. We talk a lot about the changes we've seen in kids, and obviously Mm -hmm. y'all have seen changes in boys. What would you say are some of the primary changes you've seen in boys over the years? Yeah, I think, you know, in in a lot of ways, I think boys haven't changed. I mean, developmentally, Mm -hmm. and you guys would probably say this, they still need all the same things. Right. This is the easy answer, the low-hanging fruit, is to say the culture and specifically technology, I think. That's obvious, but I I was thinking about how we've seen that change boys or change the culture around them. And I, um, Andy Crouch talks about what technology has done in our world and it has made us all sort of, or our culture sort of seek, um, immediate relevance and want to make this huge high impact really fast. You know, this, this like seeking of relevance and seeking Mm -hmm. of impact, um, and the way I've seen that play out, especially maybe in our stage four and stage five boys, I've done my homework. There on you go. I you can guys tell. Whoa, way to go. <laughs> so we've seen a shift for our older boys, both our older campers that are like maybe 12 to 16. And then our mm-hmm. counselors that are all college age boys where they're asking that question, like, do I matter? What's my mm-hmm. purpose in life? And do I have what it takes? Mm-hmm. And I think the the digital social media pressure of like, well, you you know, you have to make an impact like fast and hard and really forceful impact and be relevant right now has just ratcheted up the pressure Mm. on boys. And I know we could talk about girls maybe in social media and technology, probably more friendship stuff and body image, but for boys that are thinking about like, do I have what it takes? Mm. We've seen that in real ways in our campers and our counselors of just the the anxiety and there, well, Carter was going to, you can talk maybe about parents and how we've seen parents change because there's an aspect of that as well that I think. um, Yeah, it's interesting. I think we think so much what has changed for boys is parenting styles Mm. and what's going on. And and we include ourselves in that Mm. as we've been raising our girls. Glenn and I got married two weeks after 9-11. Wow. And Pretty much, we spent a year or two living in Oxford, Mississippi after we got married. But that was really when we were beginning our more professional time at Mm -hmm. camp. We had spent time as camp counselors and working um, in different ways um, at Alpine and other camps. But um, 9-11 hit, um, you know, I remember being a little girl and just little things like, huge charter buses would pull into camp on opening day, multiple buses. A lot of boys um, still at that point came on the train even. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, both my parents talk about coming to camp on the train, and that was still definitely a part of um, the way kids came to camp, even in the 80s. Um, Once 9-11 hit, 
all of that stopped. And, um, you know, there were different things that started to come to light, different scandals that came up in the early 2000s, you know, in churches or other places that I think parents just always took for granted, like these are, these seem to be safe spaces. Um, And when those were coming to light, I think we saw a big shift in parenting of parents got more nervous, Mm -hmm. understandably. Um, I think, you know, a term we all have grown accustomed to and thinking about helicopter parents, lawnmower Mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm including myself and Clint in that. Um, and, and and some of that was good. You know, boundaries started to be put up. Resources became more available. But I do think as parents, um, just in general, people got more nervous, yeah. um, more hesitant to let children out of their sight. Um, and I think in, in some ways, and even with COVID, the pendulum has kind of swung back where pe- people are so aware of the term helicopter parents. We yeah. want to, you know, listen to your podcast, read your books to know <laughs> how to sweet. not do that, how to be more trusting in our parenting. Mm. Um, so I think now what we've seen more is that kids are overscheduled. Yeah. Um, we can do probably a hundred podcasts on technology and the effect it's had on boys and girls. But um, I think a lot of that, what we've seen too, is just there are images even out there for parents of my child's got to be, um, you know, the best at sports, the best at academics. Um I love Wendy Mogul's book, um, huh. Blessings of a Skin we were Knee. We just talking about that yesterday. Um, yes. Because I think we're so overscheduled and making sure that our kids are getting the tutoring they need. You know, now, I mean, we've been in the thick of college searches. And David, we've talked about that with your boys. Um, and it's harder for kids to get into different colleges. And that's just the reality we're living in. Mm. And so I think parents are anxious about that. That pours over into the kids. And so um, with that overscheduling, I think we've seen a shift in how parents have really moved away um, from a play-based childhood Mm. just because there's simply not enough hours in the day if you're going to go to practice and um, you're going to have your music lessons or whatever. And all of those are good and great things that they're scheduling for their kids. But I think we've seen that sometimes it can just be too much, that there's so much value in kids getting bored, yes. um, in kids playing in the neighborhood and um, having time to just sit and pretend and play and spend hours in that moment, mm-hmm. um, I think we've also seen where parents don't want their children to suffer. Mm-hmm. I don't like to see my own girls sad sure. or going through a hard thing, and I want to fix it. And again, that's like a natural thing for parents to want to feel. But I think we miss going back to Wendy Mogul. There is a blessing in the skin knee. Right. Um, that. Our kids can grow when they're having to deal with hard things, and we don't always want to allow our kids to have to go through hard things in life um, and what they struggle with. Um, you know, even in having a bad day, it's good for our kids to not have a good day sometimes and to have hard things at school. And then I think that just the technology piece What we've seen with boys is the face-to-face interaction. They're just not getting like they used to with um, video games, you know, being um, in front of screens a lot. We have seen that a lot where boys just aren't, they aren't learning how to read faces Mm. as well. And again, we've, we've, spent a lot of time, David, talking with you about that and what they're missing out on that. So I I do agree with Glenn that boys still need a lot of the same things, but in some ways they're needing breaks from parents and technology Mm -hmm. in ways maybe they didn't need before. 
Yes. That's so good. Yes, it yeah. is. Sissy, me and Patches are just bonding over I here. can tell you are. I love it. I know. Oh big time. I was going to comment on that. For those of you who are not watching on YouTube, Patches has made her way across the floor, up onto the couch, into Glenn's lap, which right is such a smile. picture of all creatures, animals and kids feel so safe in the company of these two people. And you yes. all, you would be hard pressed to find two folks who are more passionate about kids having an experience mm. with camp than the two of us. And it's so yeah. fun to ask the two of you this question because it's your area of expertise. But what do you think camp uniquely offers kids? First thing right off the bat, number one is a chance to hang out with safely hang out in an extended like residential in our case setting with 19, 20, 21 year old kids. So mm. like the other voices thing that you guys yeah. talk about, like it's just, I mean, it is, it, it's what we're not, it, we're talking about Alpine. So it's what we feel right. like makes Alpine special. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just a couple people that are sort of stewarding this thing that God has given us. I tell the counselors, like you're the ones that are going to make this experience for the boys mm -hmm. in the summer. And they do. So that is just invaluable back to what she was talking about, about technology. Um, so that's number one is the chance for these guys to, to hear and really see more than hear yes. what it looks like to catch a vision for like, Hey, I'm a 13 year old boy. I got a million hormones. I got, you know, all these things going on, but I can catch a vision mm. for this 19 year old Whit Thomas. I was about to say that. I can be like Whit Thomas. Like, this is a yeah. vision, you know, mom and dad can preach to me all they want. And we've been in this boat too. But if you can have this really cool Christian college age guy that is living out that model, yes. it, you, you can't, I mean, you can't it's get valuable. it really anywhere else. Well, yeah. churches, certainly youth group, young life, there's all kinds of places, but we think in camp setting, mm. the residential aspect just is so unique. Yeah. Um, one of the thing I would say just in my experience for me as a kind of a quiet, shy kid coming from a medium sized town in Mississippi, it like expand the friendship mm. side of it. Like I was not particularly an athletic kid. I was not particularly like the funniest. I wasn't funny at all. I was quiet. And, you know, for boys, that's like the, that's the trade, you know, that's like the comma, the mm -hmm. currency. Yeah. And so I got to Alpine and like, I, all of a sudden, like I, it was like a fresh start and you just meet these kids from all over the Southeast. Now the country really at Alpine. And so you, you sort of, sort of broadens your horizons, like gets you out of your little bubble, nothing wrong with all the places that we come from, but like, oh, there's a wider world out there. And, you know, so there's just that friendship aspect that I think, again, because we, most camps bring in kids from all over the place, that is just a huge value you can't get anywhere else. So. Now, I agree with all those things that Glenna is saying, and I think it's so important <laughs> for our kids to have those other voices. And I love how y'all really emphasize that. Mm. Um, going back to the technology piece, um, I think there are very few places in today's world where you can get a break for an extended amount of time. Um, and again, mm -hmm. I think that's something our culture is really trying to do better on. I'm actually really encouraged by younger parents that we know and just I think they're learning honestly from my generation of what not to do, what we did not do well. But um, it's not and for us at camp, it's not just the fact that the boy is not sitting and playing video games every night or that he has his phone and that's the only way. Those are huge things for them to not have. But it's also that the adults that they are engaging with are not connected to their devices. Uh, um, it's so good. Counselors don't have their phones with them. You know, the few administrators that are walking around camp, those are very limited. Um, they have very limited access to them. And so to have an adult's undivided attention, even that is something that is rare now. Yes. Um but again, I just think it goes back to um, 
that face-to-face interaction. We had a mom from New Orleans who commented on her boys all camped through ninth grade with us and that her boys camp friends were the only friends she didn't even have to like put restrictions on technology Mm. when they were in their home because they were their whole interaction growing up as boys with those friends was you know building dams in a creek or playing outside and to for us when we see our older boys resorting back to those simple pleasures of childhood it it kind of brings tears to your eyes because yeah. you just don't see that as much. Can I throw in one more thing? You Please. Sh- this is w- w- y'all shouldn't have asked this question because we <laughs> lo- we be- obviously believe in summer mm. camp, or we wouldn't. That's no, why you I had us on. It. But uh, I don't know who said this. It wasn't me, but I love this idea that somebody said. You know, play is the work of childhood. Yes. And so one of my favorite things to do at Alpine is walk down the road after a big, one of those summer kind of afternoon thunder, rainstorm, thunderstorm, and all the kids have been in their cabins because it was lightning, we let them out. And there's this one particular place at Alpine that has this great wet weather stream, right? Mm. So it's only running with water after a big rainstorm. And you'll, I just love walking down the road and there's pockets of boys. And I'm not just talking about like eight and nine year olds, you'll see like 11, 12, 13 year olds and they're playing in this muddy, wet stream and they're building dams and they're like working together on like, all right, we're going to have this, you know, we're going to race these boats over the dam. And they don't know what they're doing. They're just having fun. Mm-hmm. But what we know is like they're, well, the main thing is there's no adults around sort of mm-hmm. curating that experience. Mm-hmm. Nothing against parents or other adults helping us grow, but like they're just figuring out <laughs> how to like, work through argument, you know, you hear them voices raised or things like that. They just figure out like how to work through arguments or who's going to lead on this part of the you know, deal. So like, it's just, it's fun, but it's also just a beautiful thing to watch like boys playing. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. So I love that image. Well, I think the other, the other piece that I think you, that is unique to camp is, um, you know, in our case, we have campers as young as, you know, finishing first grade they really start to develop independence at camp, um, yes. which I think is a really critical for boys. Um, no one's scheduling a play date for them. Um, our mm. older boys that are there, you know, for up to 25 days, they have time to make friends, to have disagreements, <laughs> to repair friendships. Mm. And, like Glenn said, that is all done in a very safe manner. There, there are all kinds of um, invisible nets, I guess you could say, around them. And there are counselors around them. There are good, healthy boundaries in place. But they have that time to figure things out without their parents. And, you know, if our ultimate goal, Glenn says a lot of times, we need to always be thinking in parenting, what's our end goal? Yes. Well, we want our kids to go off and leave one day. Even even though we may be sad about that, mm-hmm. that's our goal is for them to go off. Um, I think that's a very biblical yes. thing for us to desire for our kids. And so if they're going to be able to do that, it is good for families to have that practice of them being gone. Um, Mm -hmm. Bill Boyd, who's worked with our staff for many summers, has often said, camp is actually just as good for the parents as it is for the child. That's great. And um, I think when we can give our children spaces, and for our girls even, that was a huge part of their growing up and learning independence. They had to make their bed. And we weren't there to ask them to do that or remind them to do that. But they could start to learn to trust the adults that were around them in that place of, okay, when they're going to encourage them to do something. Um, I mean, our girls got sick at camp. We have campers that, you know, and they're there for 25 days and you have that many boys running around, someone's going to get hurt. Right. Someone's going to get sick. And there are people in place to help take care of them. And they start to develop a trust in other adults of, okay, the world is not going to end if my mom is not here with my favorite thing that I need, you know, for when I'm sick or what soup comforts me. Um, But they're going to be 
you know, people to take care of me and help me through that. And mm. I think that's a really big piece of camp as well. It's so good. So good. Well, and thinking about that, I mean, homesickness is yes. certainly a thing. Hot and topic for camps. And maybe more of a thing than it used to be. Mm. I think so. In this mm. age of anxiety. Mm. Yeah. Um, how would you all encourage parents to handle that? I mean, I, I heard a girl talking about it this week that her mom's playing with her when she went away to camp. Yes. If she was struggling. Hmm. Yes, our friend John Cox, who's actually a clinical psychologist in Jackson, Mississippi, and he was a camper and a counselor at Alpine. And I love how he frames homesickness. It's about uh, uh, the word he uses is trust. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, and that trust is a few different ways. The question is like, well, does your child know that you trust him or her? That's a great to be able to go away and leave them. And Mm. like, it's okay if you miss home, I trust you that you're, you're, you know, you're big enough and you have it deep within you to handle that and walk Mm. through that. And then like, I trust you that you're going to be able to advocate for yourself and go to a counselor and say, Hey, I'm feeling a little sad. And, and I think the third part of that is like for the parents is, okay, do I trust the camp enough to go, Hey, These are folks that are going to call me if my son or daughter is really, really having a hard time. Like they're, you know, this is not a hostage negotiation. They're not going (laughs) to hold my child hostage. You know, do I trust this camp? And so if you can kind of answer those questions, like, do Mm. I trust my child? Do I trust that he's going to advocate for himself? And do I trust the camp? Then he's, you know, he or she is ready. Now, the, the second part of that is like, tell them that you trust them, you know, like you got to talk to your kids and give them that confidence, especially that younger age group where they're like, they're really looking through your eyes to see how are you as the parent feeling about them going away. And they're going to kind of channel that energy one way or the other. And, you know, we joke about sort of a lot of times it's really the parents that are more homesick than the kids. You know I mean? That is classic. And that Mm. can, before camp, you know, tell them. So here's my one piece of practical advice on that for anybody who's going to send their kid away to camp this summer, maybe for the first time. And this is not original either. Um, I have to give credit to Chris Thurber on this. Do not make a pickup deal. So a pickup deal being, and again, as parents, sometimes we think we do, we're doing what's best for our kids. And so you think, oh, I'll just tell them like, hey, if you're if you're not having a great time or if you miss home so much, just, you know, give me this. Give me the little you know, secret sign in the photo or write the letter. And I that the photos is a whole other uh, topic. Yeah, we of could talk, we about, could talk that, about right? And I'll come pick you up mm-hmm. again. If we on the surface, that seems like, oh, that's that's a good thing to do as parents. But what you're really communicating is. I don't trust you, Mm. you know, little Timmy, to go and handle this on your own. So I'll bail you out if you can't deal with this. Mm. And 99.99999% of kids are going to be able to work through that and be fine. I mean, we've been doing this 20 plus years now, and I can count on, and literally on one hand, the amount of kids that have actually had to go home of the thousands and thousands. So take a deep breath, make sure that they know that they can do it and send them off in confidence. Yeah. And I'll talk about a few practical things too. Um, I think one, parents need to talk to their children about it if they're worried about it. Mm. But I actually think parents need to talk to parents about it. Mm. And deal with their own homesickness for their child. Yes. Um, because that's a very real thing. Um, I'm always impressed when I talk to parents. Um, and they talk about, I had a mom once say, you know, my husband and I talked about it and we decided it's best if I don't look at the photos every day. You know, that you can even start to become mama bear in that mode when you're looking at camp photos. And not every camp does that, but a lot of camps will post photos every day. And when that becomes, I guess when looking at them takes over you and you're analyzing everything, I've had moms say, 
Well, I called, you know, my adult daughter who lives across town to come and look and analyze this photo. And remember Mm. that they are just that. They are photos. They are snapshots. They are not telling the full story. Mm. Um, And again, I think we could do a whole... We've had a mom call us from the closet on like a 20-year anniversary, (laughs) like... Uh, trip with her husband and she was like I can't talk very loudly my husband I don't want him to know I'm calling because he thinks I'm crazy you know and I mean it was just like and I get it like we have kids like it was hard for me to send my girls off and I do this for a living you know we we run a camp for a yes. living so yeah. I get it um the other thing is I think when you receive a you know when you get a homesick letter in the mail like Glenn said Take a deep breath. Um, I think if parents can remember that it's snail mail, Mm. you know, Mm. we're so used to getting information instantly. And that letter was probably written three days ago, maybe even longer. Um, Letters are often written at camp during the most boring time of day. Um, And (laughs) when kids have a moment to sit and be still, um, Lisa Demore, um, that wrote Untangled, talks about how parents often are the edge of the swimming pool, and that when kids are out in the middle of the swimming pool, you know, they're splashing around, they're laughing with their friends. When they come to the edge of the swimming pool, which is us as parents, they're tired, they're out of breath, they need a moment to just kind of catch their breath and then go back into the pool with their friends. Um, And that's what children might be doing when they're writing a homesick letter. Mm -hmm. I often tell parents, take that moment to realize that's a big deal that the kid could identify his feelings, know that he could tell someone. um, And and just if parents can remember that when it was written, the circumstances it was written in. Now, certainly when parents get multiple letters, you know, that's when we encourage people to reach out to the camp office or to the camp directors. Um, Glenn's mom actually was brilliant in her letter writing to Glenn. We found so many great letters that she wrote um, to Glenn when he was a camper, but she would always talk about her days while he was gone as very boring. You know, Mm. all I did today was take your little sister to the grocery store. Or it's so hot in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, It's hard if a parent is sending a child a postcard from Disney World. Right. And that kid is like, wait, I want to be at Disney World with my younger sibling. You know, and just being thoughtful about your communication with a child, but reminding them, I am so proud of you for, you know, being at camp and all the things that you're doing. I can't wait to hear about that when you get home. So those are just some practical pieces. Yeah, that's great stuff. One more tip around language. And this is actually the language that we use with the boys in our opening day meeting when they get there. And so I think this is helpful. And that is like, normalizing homesickness. So I think this is something parents can talk about. You're not going to make your kid homesick by talking about it before. And so the the language is like, hey, if you get to camp and you miss home a little bit, that's actually a good thing. That means you, you know, there's something at home that you right. care enough about right. to miss. And like, yeah. that's totally normal. And that's how we, how we talk about it on the first day of camp. And I, that's, I think, what parents can do. And then secondly, like, here's your superpower Little Timmy, this is the this is the deal. This is what we say to kids on opening day. This is your superpower. When you have those feelings of sadness, the thing that almost every single time will help you feel better is to go tell somebody about it. Mm. Especially with boys, right? They don't want they like you think, yeah. oh, nobody else is feeling this sure. way. And so as a parent beforehand, if you can help us as the camp directors empower them to go, hey, go tell somebody. It's gonna make you feel better. That's that's my tip for parents beforehand. That is probably one of the biggest things parents can do before sending their child off is just teaching them about advocating for themselves. Mm. And um, I mean, Glenn talks to all of our campers the first day of camp and pointing out these are the people that you can go and talk to. You can talk to your um, cabin counselor, your head counselor. I let the little boys especially know right where I sit in the dining hall so that they know here is where 
quote unquote mom and dad are sitting and where I can find them. But, you know, if something is making them uncomfortable and you can talk about these things in your own home, and that's actually a great tool to give kids whether or not they're going to camp. I mean, if kids are on a sports team, if they're going to school, if they're going to church camp, if they're going on a retreat, they need to know how to advocate for themselves. And that's Mm -hmm. something I think parents are doing a much better job um, in more recent years. And I think that's that's a really good and healthy thing. Mm. Y'all, as a I mean, our our little hope town is teeny compared to what y'all are doing, but I cannot jump up and down over what you're saying enough. All the y'all things. Know. Thank you. Y'all know. I, the one other thing I would add is I always feel a little panicky when an application comes across that says, my son or my daughter has never spent the night away from home. <laughs> I always want to call them and say, let's do a little practicing before yes. they come spend a little time with us. Absolutely. And y'all especially yeah, that's a great time. Yeah. point. Yeah. It's like, what do Even you need to, to do to prepare? Even to a grandparent's right. house. Exactly. Yes. 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 Let's Having do some practice. Some separation time. Yes. yes. Oh, Carter, yeah. like before our girls would, could go to camp. And again, we're the camp directors. It, Carter was amazing with this. She created this list of all the things you have to be able to do oh, before you can so go. Great. And I mean, it was like practical stuff. Well, I mean, girls, they were like little bitty. So it was like, cut your meat, you know, <laughs> like oh, take a shower. Right. I mean, this is like kindergarten. So you know? girls actually came up so. with, they helped us come up with this list, which this actually goes back to just more practical stuff for homesickness. Anytime you can give your child agency in mm. the sending off to camp and before they go, it is going to be so much easier for a mom to go on Amazon and order everything. And I understand that in some cases, that's what you have to do. But let it, take them to Target and let them pick out their toothbrush and their toothpaste and what kind yes. of shampoo they want. That is going to give them so much buy-in and feel ownership that they are a part of making this decision. Oh, but Carter, that's so good. Yeah, there's some Thank great you. things you can do with your kids. That yes. Are easy. This is exactly gonna, what I knew was going to happen I know, when I'm we had these two episode. here. I'm going to send this episode. I really was thinking, I'm going to get on Camp Minder and send it to every parent whose kids are coming to Hopetown exactly this summer. Exactly what I, think I knew every would camp happen in the when we sat down with you two. I, I know. Y'all. I know. So good. Well, we're talking about the benefits of camp for kids. I want to talk about the benefits of camp for camp counselors. And I love... Glenn, that you mentioned stage mm-hmm. five, we are in the ages and stages season of our podcast mm-hmm. and we're mm-hmm. at stage five and just finished talking briefly. And I'm so excited for you all to talk more about it. I talked about the language I use with boys is training ground that mm-hmm. I think yes. the summers allows for in a unique way that I think as much growth happens in the summers of the college years as happens in the classroom during the academic year. And I would love to hear you all talk about that for a few minutes. And and again, I think all the way back to my being in college and experiencing these amazing guys at that point. And I remember the first time I did staff training with mm-hmm. you all. And my first thought was, I want my boys to work here. <laughs> and then my Thank next you. thought was, I want to bring my daughter with me because I would like for her to see yes. this dating pool right here. Like, <laughs> oh, my goodness, I've never seen so many remarkable young men in one space. And and I also you all it's I don't know if I've ever told you this is probably my favorite part of doing staff training is walking up in the morning and hearing them worship. Uh. And how rare it is to be in a space where it's only male voices and they are singing at the top of their lungs like it is. It's beautiful and that they start the day in that way, in that space. Mm. So thinking about that, will you just talk a little bit about what you think counselors get from the experience, how they find purpose in in this role in the summers? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the obvious thing to your point is like they're at that age where they're trying to figure out purpose and like, do I have what it takes? And for a lot of these guys, you know, I mean, college is amazing, high school sports teams even, but that is all about like them a little bit. So for a lot of these guys, it's the first time that they've had purpose outside of themselves, right? The purpose of a sports team or even college is like to better yourself and the team, I guess. But this is the first time they've had responsibility for other people's lives. And so that is just by its nature, life changing. And I think frees them up a little bit to go, okay, I can do this. Like I have what it takes. Like, and so we say in a very real sense, like we're preparing you to be a better 
father and a husband. So that's sort of the obvious thing. But I actually think in today's sort of cultural context, and for boys specifically, I don't, I can't speak as much about girls, but I think in today's workforce, the, what camp offers is a training ground on the soft skills that boy don't don't come as naturally to yes. boys. The emotional intelligence, the curiosity, the ability to listen, all the things that I think come a little more naturally maybe to girls. And so I, I kind of, again, we're camp people. I kind of push back on this idea of like, and we hear this a lot, like the whole thing, like it's that sort of like pat on the head, like, oh, how sweet. He's going to work at a summer camp this summer. Well, he can do that maybe in high school or after his freshman year, but then he's yes. got to move on to like real life. And we I kind of push back and this. go, yeah. camp is real life because right. I mean, nothing against internships, but like those are technical skills that you can, you know, you can learn on the job, but the soft skills, I mean, we, we, and we really emphasize this for our counselors, like thinking about calling and like, you might get to Alpine and realize like, Hey, I really like planning a lesson, you know, for my, for teaching tennis. And I'm pretty good at it. Like this, you know, you just learn about your gifts and skills, mm -hmm. I think in different ways that really inform your calling on like what you might want to do more than just like, I want to be an engineer or an accountant, but like, here's some gift sets that God has given me that I can use no matter what that sort of major is. So that's kind of where I go with mm -hmm. stage five and what we provide for boys or counselors. Yeah. Just to add to Glenn, I mean, even when you talk about camp staff, I, I start to get teary thinking about it because the relationships that we have built with staff over the years and the importance of their role in camp, I mean, it's the most critical role. And also when I think about our staff, I, the first image that comes to mind is the last day of camp when every camper has gotten packed up, driven off, and Glenn and I are standing there with just staff and you see these college guys who two and a half months before, you know, rolled into camp, fresh off a of college campus, all wanting to find their place, find their significance. And they are literally weeping mm -hmm. when they have to tell each other goodbye. Um, you just know, if you just saw that snapshot, you would think, what is this about? Yeah. And I think for them, like Glenn said, they have had an opportunity to tap into their gifts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think all of us, one thing we love about camp is that it's just simple living. And you, you've you had to wake up and be creative. You've had to be flexible. You, you don't know when a rainstorm's going to hit and you've got to come up with a whole new game plan of mm -hmm. how you're going to entertain 10 year old boys. Right. Um, they also have had to be really vulnerable with one another mm. because, um, you know, in a 25 day session, you cannot hide your weaknesses. Um, you cannot do that alone. And so they have really um, built these friendships where they've had to encourage one another to get through the day. Um, I think they also have had times where they've been able to tap in, back into their childhood, which is so fun. You know, they're singing songs. I mean, where else do you see college age guys singing songs? Yes. Right. And they're the ones singing the loudest in our gym yes. when we gather together to do that. Um, I have really been struck over the years hearing boys um, and grown men talk about we have a guy who um, is a doctor now who talks, and this hap this story has happened repeatedly, but we're in their medical school interview. The number one thing they have talked about is summer camp. Right. You know, whether that's they find a connection with um, someone that's doing their interview who maybe didn't even go to Alpine, but just did camp. I mean, Sissy and I yeah. were sitting here talking about camp stories and there's a connection there but I think also when men um 
are spending multiple summers and women, but since we're talking specifically about boys camp, when they see that they have spent summer after summer in a place where um, it may not necessarily be in a medical role, but they're seeing, okay, this person really cares about children and they care about the growth of children and relationships. Um, I think they... They they find that so interesting and unique, um, and we could spend a whole, again, we could keep talking about this for hours, but we think it's one of the most critical things for mm. college-age um, students to do, and yeah. there are so many lessons from it. Well, I, I want to shift to your girls for a minute. Yes. And I would love to know how spending the summers with boys all these years has changed the way you've raised your girls. So I mentioned earlier, I grew up at camp Mm -hmm. and um, our girls are this, they have spent every summer, um, at least part of their summer has been spent with us at Alpine. I mean, we, we have only raised our girls in a boys camp scenario. I think when I think about raising our girls, what, um, what has impacted are raising them in an all boys environment is one, and this goes back to other voices actually, but I think one of the most crucial um, staff positions in camp that we've had as our girls were growing up was who took care of them in the summer Mm -hmm. alongside us. So when our girls were younger, we always had um, different babysitters come in and they also stayed, most of them stayed the whole summer. And for us, that was so critical of who was spending time with our girls. And I think now that our girls are about to go off to college, it's actually some of those women that they look to the most in their college decision um, and how they processed that decision, which is, you all know, it's a huge decision. Yes. And um I think some of those were even louder voices than us. Um, But I also think raising our girls at camp, it, um, and I'll talk more about this when I talk about my mom later on, but just being outside and seeing, um, you know, that what we love about camp for boys, we also loved in raising our own girls. Um, just the gifts that playing in a stream, you know, what that can give our children. And again, Glenn just talked about the play aspect um, and not being overscheduled. That was such a gift for our girls. Um, I think also what I really appreciate about Glenn and that our girls have seen this modeled out in him is that you know, we we love single-sex environments. Our girls go to an all-girls school. They've been to an all-girls camp. We run an all-boys camp. And we're not saying that's the only place where children can learn. But I think what, what I saw come out of that, the fruits of that, is that Glenn has always um, been really intentional about that it's important that I'm in the room and that even our girls' voices are really important in speaking into that and how do we see something that, you know, what is our perspective that maybe is different from a male perspective? And um, I I just think that's huge that he sees the importance of female voices in that um, and that our girls know their voice is important and that they can have a strong part in something even when they're not the main role if that makes sense you know they're not the keepers so i don't know that i can add much to that you stole my answers just (laughs) she has done carter i would say has done such an amazing job Mm. because she believes in camp of having other voices for the girls Mm. and fostering their imagination outside so and their their spiritual life i mean i think there's so many pieces of their spiritual life that Mm. we were always you know, we had a role in that, obviously, mm-hmm. as parents and needed to take that role seriously. But I think when they saw these older girls that came in to take care of them and how, um, you know, their faith was so important to them and how they were spending time in the Word each day, talking about their faith openly with our girls. Um, 
And then just other things of seeing how they engaged with technology, how they interacted with boys and how boys interacted with them. Mm. All those small details, um, really just how they were woven together to teach our girls so many amazing things. Mm. Okay, that's a great transition into a question I wanted to ask the two of you. So you both are so intentional with helping kids grow spiritually. What would you say are some things that parents could do at home in that space? So I'll circle all the way back to sort of the idea of the culture we're in now with this idea that we have to be immediately relevant, immediately make this huge impact. And one of my favorite, so this is, I mean, this is a long winded way to say this, but one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible is Deuteronomy six and it's poised, it's Moses talking to the Israelites and it's poised sort of right in between. Well, he's brought the, the Lord's brought them out of Egypt and then they've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and they're on the precipice of going into the promised land. And he, I just think a lot of times in the Bible, again, to contrast with the idea of relevance and immediate impact, God talks about like three generations. The, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there's a, there's a verse in that chapter, Deuteronomy 6, it says, um, in the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And so I just think it's so crucial as parents, this is sort of getting away from camp, to talk to our children, not just about the pres the immediate present or the future, but talk about your extended family. Mm. I listened to Dr. Your, y'all had Michael Gurian on, yes. who we love so much, talk about how we've so lost good. this idea of the nuclear family and the extended mm. family. And I think we need to be talking with our kids about what has God done in our family's lives over generations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so key for them to hear, like, the Lord has been with us. So when you're in this current hard time, whatever that may be that you're walking through with your kids, let's look back to ways, not only in our little family's life that the Lord has been faithful to us, but ways that he has, quote, brought us out of Egypt, you mm -hmm. know, in the past. So that's just where I went with that question. Um spiritually and thinking about that f from a camp context, you know, helped mm -hmm. me as well. So, so John one fourteen um, says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and the word dwelt. And really my mom had a love for word, has a love for words and I love unpacking words, but thinking just about that word dwelling mm -hmm. and how that can also mean setting up camp mm -hmm. and um, pitching a tent um, and how the Lord did that with his people. And um, we talk a lot about this with staff, but I think it's so relevant with parents. And so I think the first thing parents can think about is just their relationship with their child and how they are in relationship with their child, even just physically. Um, our friend Paige Brown um, gives an illustration to our staff in training about um, a question being asked to some adults about what was one thing that their parents did to really impact them. And a girl wrote about her parents um, always showing up and coming to them. Mm. And um, a girl wrote about her dad when he would come home from work um, in this household of girls. If they were jumping on the trampoline, he would walk outside untie his shoes and get on the trampoline. If they were in the kitchen baking cookies, he would tie on the apron. Mm -hmm. um, like the idea of physically coming physically to them, coming not, to not them. asking them to do what you want to do. Um, but. I love that too. And mm -hmm. this was something that I saw Glenn do from a young age with our girls just very naturally. But for some parents, and there are going to be other things that don't come as natural to us, but um, I, I mean, when I close my eyes and think back to when the girls were little, I mean, 
and again, we're an all-girl household, and Glenn would enter the picture of playtime, and he was right there on the ground playing. You know, if they were playing restaurant, well, he was the chef, and he was throwing things left and right and laughing and giggling. Our girls um, and their little friend Betsy loved to play wedding, and the countless times Glenn had to sit or be the groom and you know, <laughs> sit in this wedding. But I'm going um, to start crying now that I'm yeah, thinking about it. I know. Those days sure. being gone. But, um, you know, I think as parents, and again, in this day and age of information where we can get so much just inundated with information, mm. we kind of lose sight of just the big picture of or simple things that we can do with our kids and just how are we relating to them. Mm. Um, I think we can overcomplicate things. But I think, um, you know, sometimes when we think about the spiritual development in our own home, a parent can get overwhelmed thinking about, well, how do I do an in-depth devotion? And maybe they try sitting down and having family devotion and it doesn't go well. You know, or people are rolling their eyes or grunting, you know, just whatever. Um, but that first, just thinking about how you're relating and then children they're going to be able to hear the things that we have to say if we know that we are for them. And mm. I think as parents, and, we, and we've done this with our girls, we want to bring and indoctrinate them into our world and into our interests. I think about boys specifically, so much of this can be wrapped up into sports. And, um, you know, we want our children to love the things that we love. And there's a time and place for that. But are we showing them that we care what they care about? Mm -hmm. I mean, Glenn has gone to countless modern dance recitals or nutcracker performances. It's not because Glenn loves the world of dance, though he has grown to have a more of an appreciation of that. Mm -hmm. But it's because... The people he cares the most about, that is what one of them has been really interested in. Or, you know, whether it's tennis matches, and he doesn't care as much about that, but because they care about it. Um, I think just also thinking about, um, for parents, if we just look at how Jesus related to us, I mean, related to his people in the Bible, but even specifically to his disciples, I love reading through the Gospels because there's so much interaction with the disciples and they are doing the same thing boys do now. You know, they're seeing, I was the fastest, right. you know, I ran, or I right. want to sit the closest to you, right. you know, um, and how Jesus is patient with them mm. and um, hears them, he definitely speaks to them specifically and will even pull back Old Testament teachings. But um, I think that's just an easy place to start for parents if they don't even know where to begin is just looking at how Jesus relates to his people. Um some practical things that we've done in our own home and we've not done any of this perfectly. But I think um one, just trying to talk about our faith just with in general conversation. You know, there are definitely times where I think it's important to gather around the kitchen table. Um, we've personally loved opening um the Jesus Storybook Bible. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way, but I also think it's important just to open up scripture yeah. and and it's also important for kids to see us carving out time for that. Um but also just in how we talk about openly about what our faith means to us. And um, you know, we talk to our staff about the most important lesson they might teach a child is not during devotional time. It is probably going to be when they ask for forgiveness or say, I'm sorry. You know, I raised my voice at y'all today. I'm really sorry about that. To see someone older who has more power coming down on their level. I think that's huge for our girls. And, you know, in families, um, a lot of our children's struggles are going to be things that we've struggled with. Well, if, 
if we can share that with them and say, you know, I really have struggled with this and I've had to pray for years about this and where they can see that we have also wrestled with things and even wrestled with things in our spiritual life, I think that is such a gift for children if we're not always trying to act perfect with them um, and can really be vulnerable with them. I think that's huge. Y'all, this is so good. This is so good. We like to end with something fun and food related. And two-part question, queso or guac, and what's your favorite taco? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) To all of it. All of it. Food in general. Queso for me. I'm definitely guac. Mm. Yes, for any taco as well. But if I had to pick something like a brisket taco with something a little spicy, like a jalapeno or maybe some pico de gallo and Mm. and some good cheese, and I'm happy. I'll take a brisket taco as well. The good news is we don't just need to talk about tacos. (laughs) We convinced these dear folks to stay over and we're about to share lunch because we don't want them to leave. And now you understand why the folks listening. I loved Alpine before you came in. I love it that much more knowing that you all are who are pouring into these boys with a whole lot of other amazing folks on staff, too. But just could not be any more grateful for your hearts, your humility, your thoughtfulness. Thank you. Uh, It is the Lord's work, as I'm Mm -hmm. sure you guys would say about this place. And we're Mm -hmm. grateful to be able to steward it and uh, grateful to be in partnership with people like you guys Mm -hmm. uh, in the crossovers of life. So we feel like we can do our job because of people like y'all. We have really relied on your resources um, in not just our professional life, but in our personal life as well. And we're really grateful for y'all and the work you do. We got a lot of great new counselors, David. They're going to be eager to hear from you. I and cannot be wait soon, to be so. with them. You too. <laughs> Thank you, and we can't wait to see you then. Mm-hmm. But thank you for being with us. Thanks for saying yes to this invitation. Yes. David, what a team we have that we get to call friends who help make this podcast possible. Amanda Young, our operations manager. Chris Starrett, our engineer and producer. Our management team at KCH. And we are thrilled to be a part of the That Sounds Fun Network. Our music was created by the insanely talented Dave Haywood of Lady A. And if this podcast felt helpful to you, please consider subscribing, liking, sharing, all the things. We are grateful for you and cheering you on always.